Welcome to the Fearfully and Wonderfully Made Show with Dr. June. I am elated that you are joining me today as we explore holistic health and wellness with a biblical spin. This show is for informational purposes only, and I look forward to serving you. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Fearfully and Wonderfully Made Show with Dr. June, your board-certified emergency physician who, after nearly a decade in medicine, began to feel like a drug dealer with a license, like I was not getting to the root cause of my patient's ailments, like I was just treating symptoms. So I went back to first principles. I went to Genesis and I asked God what his plan for creation was, what his plan for health was for the human body. And he has taken me on a wondrous journey, which I am so glad to be sharing with you today. Thank you for joining me. So the last episode we talked about (laughs) God's Word. We went through Genesis 1 verses 1 through 3. And we're going to pick up in Genesis. We're going to go through Genesis chapter 1 because it is so crucial that we understand the beginning. Because if we do not know the beginning, we will not know who we are. So we will start verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day day one God created light but he did not just create light because it says in verse 5 and the evening and the morning were the first day Day one, he also created time. Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. God defines time. Wow. We serve the God who defines time. He knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. We serve a great God, the creator of heaven and earth. Wow. How great is that? In verse 6, Genesis 1 verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day I see a pattern here God speaks let there be light let there be a firmament and it is so God is speaking things into creation he is not standing on a ladder and drawing (laughs) the heavens or the firmament he is speaking this into existence and He creates with his word and then he calls the light day. He names his creation. Wow. Verse 8, so that was day 2. Day 1 is light and time. Day 2 is the firmament. Day 3, verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. (laughs) And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. So he said, let there be, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. And he named it. He named them earth and seas. In the King James, in my Bible, it actually, when it says earth in verse 10 and he called the dry land earth 
and the gathering together of the waters called he sees those are actually capitalized he named them intentionally i see intention in god's creation and god saw that it was good in verse 11 and god said let the earth that he just created bring forth grass the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so verse 12 and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good verse 13 and the evening and the morning were the third day so we see in verse 9 let the waters under the heaven be gathered together and then in verse 11 let the earth bring forth grass he is talking to the earth to bring forth grass but when we look at what he is creating the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind everything is after its kind god is intentional about his creation he is creating but he is giving his creation the right the capacity to create on its own the power of creation is in its ability to multiply on its own wow the power of creation is in its multiplication in its sustenance and god saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day verse 14 and god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so <laughs> and god made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day you know what's really interesting is i always thought reading genesis 1 that when god said let there be light that he had actually created the sun to give light so we see that it's actually on day four that he created the sun the moon and the stars so this whole time day one day two day three the light that God had created was actually what was bringing light and illumination to the earth and the heavens as he was creating. I'd actually never thought of that. It was God's light that provided illumination when he was creating until day four. And he gave these lights he gave them a purpose he said he made two great lights in verse 16 the greater light to rule the day the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also so he's creating he names the lights and he gives them purpose god recognizes mm, god knows that when he creates he creates with purpose and he gives his creation purpose and that is what sustains his creation is the purpose 
Verse 20, Genesis 1 verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. It's always after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. With every day of creation, I see great intentionality. I see strategy. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. God spoke to the waters to bring forth abundantly the moving creature. God is still speaking to creation. He is still speaking in creation. He is using his words to create. And he gave them purpose. He said to the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air, Be fruitful, purpose, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. Multiplication is the purpose. Day 6, Genesis 1, verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So here we see God is not just saying let man be made. He's saying let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them now this is the purpose god is speaking out the purpose let them have dominion over the fish of the sea from day three over the fowl of the air that were created on day three and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth god has created everything else light the moon the stars the fish out of the sea the fowl of the air the birds and now he is creating man when he was creating everything else he said and god said let there be light let there be a firmament for the heaven let there be seas and let the waters under the heaven he speaks those things but when it comes to man he says let us he speaks to himself that word god in genesis 1 1 is actually elohim and elohim is actually a plural form so let us father son holy ghost let us make man in our own image in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. He created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. And God 
said unto them, just like he was doing for the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the beasts, he blessed them. God blessed them and said unto them, verse 28, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. So the pattern we have seen when God is creating, God creates and then he names and then he gives them purpose. And when God created the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air, he blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply. That's in verse 22 when he's talking to the fish and the fowl of the air. And then in verse 27, he's telling man the same thing. He is giving him his purpose. He is giving him his mandate. It's a five-fold mandate. One, be fruitful. In the context of creation, what does fruitfulness mean? What is fruit? Fruit is a part of a tree that carries seed in it. It is the part of the tree which, when eaten by an animal, by man, the seed falls to the ground. When it falls to the ground and it is covered with dirt, it grows roots. And when it has grown enough roots and gotten all the nutrients that it needs and all the water and all the warmth and all the energy then it sprouts out and now we see the shoot the shoot which is the leaves the flowers and eventually the fruit and when that fruit falls or when that fruit is eaten by an animal the seed falls to the ground and the cycle repeats itself but now god is talking to man that he just created he said be fruitful when he's saying be fruitful that makes me think about conception when you think about fruit right the sperm the ova conception we have an a zygote and it is covered in darkness in the mother's womb, in the uterus, and then the placenta is made. And then the cells, the clump of cells, begins to form different organs. They begin to differentiate. And now you have a heart, and now you have lungs, and now you have the neural tube. Everything in order. Be fruitful. Multiply. When he's saying be fruitful... We recognize that there's a part of growth that is hidden, that you do not see that is still happening. When you have a woman that is has just conceived one month, two months, you don't look at her and think that she is pregnant. It's only in the later months that she begins to show that you're able to see, oh, there is fruit growing in her womb. And after an appointed time, just like with the plants, there is seed, there is time, there is harvest. You plant a seed, you give it time and everything that it needs, air, water, nutrients in the soil, right? Sunshine. And during that time, it is formed. It becomes planted. And at the appointed time, the shoot shoots up. At the appointed time, the baby is delivered. And we have delivery out of darkness into marvelous light. But how does that happen? Delivery is a painful process. The mother goes through labor to be able to deliver the fruit of her womb harvest in the same vein requires labor. If you're going to plant a field of potatoes or whatever food it is, whatever plant it is, you drop the seed into the ground, you cover it. In the darkness is where the growth starts. 
You don't see it. You don't see the growth, but it is happening. The seed is taking root and in due season at the appointed time, it shall shoot forth and then you will see the shoot. And when the shoot is out, the shoot, remember, is the leaves, the stems, the branches, and then the fruit. What has this got to do with health? See, many times we don't recognize that there is a time and a season for everything. Just like uh, King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time and a season for everything. There is a time for conception. There is a time to be hidden. When you look at a fruit or look at a seed in the ground, it is dark. It is hidden. When you look at a fetus in the womb, it is hidden darkness but it's in the darkness that the organs are formed it is in the darkness that the child the fruit of the womb actually develops it's only at the appointed time that delivery happens and the first thing that we hear after a delivery a successful delivery is a cry because it is painful to be delivered out of darkness into the marvelous light and delivery is no small feat any woman who has been through delivery understands the labor that has to go into actually finally holding the fruit of your labor any farmer will tell you that harvest time is the hardest time because yes you plant the seed in the ground and you water it and you feed it and you make sure that there's enough sun and all of those things but it's only when the harvest is here that you have to harvest the grain and the fruit of your labor the farmer has purpose when they finally see the fruits of their labor. Many of us are struggling because we have not labored, because we have not been fruitful. When we are not fruitful, when the Creator says, be fruitful, that is a mandate, that is an order, that is purpose, that was why we were created. So if you have no fruit, you feel no purpose and without purpose we see a lot of this these days people without purpose roaming around trying to figure out what is my purpose what was i made to do on earth and they're reading all these books and they're eat reading eat pray love and we see in that book how people are how this woman was going around the world went to different parts of the world to eat pray and love and that's how she found her purpose in this life no your purpose is to eat the word of God, to pray to the Most High God, the Creator who made you to be in relationship with Him and love, exude His love to not just yourself but to those around you so they can see His love in you and come to you. That is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are love, according to Galatians 5.22, love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. What fruits are we exuding? What fruits are we showing? The Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. What are your fruits? Some of the reasons for the anguish in our lives is because we do not have purpose we have not identified that purpose be fruitful the bible says the second mandate is multiply when i first read this be fruitful multiply i was just thinking that god was telling man you know go on have children right but that is very true absolutely we've been seeing how he was studying the fish and the fowl, be fruitful, multiply the cattle, be fruitful, multiply. Even the herb and the fruit tree, the herb bearing seed, right? It has to be fruitful and multiply. But multiply what? Yes, yourself. Sure. 
but multiply what is in your hand. What is in your hand, friend? What skills do you have? What talents do you have? What do you bring to the table? Multiply. Multiply yourself. Multiply your joy. Multiply your knowledge, what you have, what you know. Multiply that. When you look at the parable of the talents, in Matthew 25, Jesus was showing us people with different talents to one. He gave one to another, two, and to another five, each according to his ability. Everyone has different gifts, different talents, different abilities. The task is to multiply what is in your hand. That's the assignment. Multiply. We see people going around the world trying to find their purpose when it's really already in their hands. Be fruitful. Multiply. Three, replenish the earth. What does replenish mean? It means to restore. It means to fill up again. Restore your hope. Restore your joy. Restore that which has been lost. Restore. Restoration. That is part of your mandate. Four, subdue the earth. What is to subdue? To subdue is to overcome. Overcome those obstacles. Overcome that addiction. Overcome those bad habits that are keeping you down. Overcome. That is your mandate. Subdue the earth. When God made everything, he gave it to Adam, to Adam which is man, man and woman, to steward, subdue the earth, overcome it. The last one is have dominion. What is dominion? Dominion is sovereignty. It is control over your kingdom. God is saying to you, control your kingdom. But what is your kingdom? What is your territory? One, what do you have in your hand? Multiply it. Your territory is all the things that you have authority over. What have you been through, friend? What you've been through, you have authority over. What you have authority over, you can speak to. And that is your territory. That is your kingdom. I'll tell you a story. I'll give you an example. My mother. Oh, my mother. My mother is one of God's if not God's, <laughs> greatest gift to me. And she exemplifies this so well. So my mother was born in Uganda, in Fort Portal, in Western Uganda. And she grew up and she trained as a teacher. We're going to fast track this story <laughs> because we don't have time. But she was a teacher and she did well. And then she got married and then she became a stay-at-home mom and took care of her children. She had four children. And when her youngest child was two and a half years old, her husband died of AIDS and she took care of him. She nursed him on his deathbed. She was there. And he died. Now, when he died of AIDS in the 1990s, Anybody who was alive in Uganda at that time knows how hard of a time that was. People were dying. I feel like we were at a funeral every week. And on New Year's Day 1990, that was our day. Our family lost our patriarch. My father died. My mother was a widow. She was 32 years old with four children under the age of 10 with a disease her husband had died of a disease that had no cure and all science said that is if somebody has AIDS anybody that they've come into sexual contact with right will die too because we know that HIV is spread through sexual contact and when I was conceived my father had tuberculosis which is an AIDS defining illness and of course my younger sister came after me and so science says that my mother was infected that I was infected and my younger sister too 
And so my mother was living in that reality. She had to take care of her children. And yet, in her mind, I mean, science said there was a death sentence. Right? It was only a matter of time until she was gone too and she was going to leave her four daughters. To who? Meanwhile, her brother-in-law also died of AIDS. Meanwhile, her sister died of AIDS. Everyone came to my mother's house. My mother took care of everybody. Her sisters came home. My mother nursed them till their last day. And they died. She was that person. So many people came through my mother's home. And she took care of them without complaining. And she trusted God and she looked to God. I told you the story of how when my father died on his deathbed after he had just died, she got all four of us, her four daughters, and she said a prayer and she she committed us her children to God and told us that God was now our father. And so we grew up knowing that. And God was now her husband. And I watched as my mother woke up every day to try and hustle and starting this business and it fails and starting this business and it succeeds and she's doing all of these things knowing that she doesn't have time. She's racing against the clock trying to make sure that her children are taken care of when she goes. Who do you leave four children to? Her siblings were dying in her home. Everyone was leaving their children to her. And she stood strong. I saw my mother pray. I saw my mother fast. And she did what she could in that time. And she raised us, and by God's grace, she lived. She still lives today because God is gracious. But I'm saying all this to say, she went through all of that hardship. She put us all through school. This woman is strength personified. God's strength personified in a human being and she would tell people in her same situation widows who had just lost their husbands how she had overcome and she was encouraging them and she began to realize that her hardship her life was actually encouraging to other people and that she was actually good at encouraging other people at infusing courage and strength in other people when they needed it and she realized that she was a good counselor. And so when we were older, she decided that she would go back to school and studied counseling. And she did. She studied counseling. She did well. But at the end of her course, she realized that Ugandans, much like many Africans, do not like to go to counseling. So she said, well, if Ugandans will not go to counseling, I'll bring counseling to them. So she genius she started a tv talk show called the untold story my mother mrs betty tivaleka started a tv talk show where she was telling people about her story but bringing guests onto the show who had overcome so much adversity and on those shows people would watch other people go through life and what they did to overcome and then she ended up going to women's prisons in Uganda and the women telling their stories. And I remember one of the stories, this is one of my favorite stories. My mother hosted a woman who was HIV positive, she and her children, and they lived in an area in Uganda that was um, in a swamp. And so every time that it rained... They had to put their medicines on the roof because when it rained, it flooded and their medications would disintegrate. And somebody, a pastor actually, watched that show, watched the show of this woman with HIV who was also widowed and she was taking care of all these children also with HIV and they had access to medications, praise God. But every time it rained, 
their health was at stake. So this pastor who watched the show that my mom did of their untold story, he built them a house where they did not have to struggle every time it rained. My mother walked into her purpose. My mother, remember, was a teacher. She used those skills from when she was a teacher. Then she became a mother and she took care of not just us, but everybody. And she was a nurse taking care of not only her husband, but her sisters when they died in her home. And a mother to everybody who came in. I remember I was talking to my sisters and we're talking about how so many people came through our home, not just young children, but there were people who were at university studying, but they stayed with us because my mother was so generous and she was so kind, but she was tough. She was tough. She had to be tough to take on a role like this. But all of those things, it's all of those hardships, all of those stages in her life that set her up to become the host of a show that changed people's lives on a national level. Whatever stage you're at, you are being formed into the person that God created you to be. You are being planted and it seems dark just like the baby is in the womb and it's dark and sometimes it doesn't look like the mother is pregnant you are being formed into the person that you're supposed to be god is a strategic god my mother recognized what was in her the teacher in her the mother in her the nurse in her the strength in her with all the adversity that she went through that is what made her who she is, who she became, her purpose in the fullness of time, her purpose went forth and through the labor of her studies and through the labor of everything that she had done, the labor of love, she was born, delivered from the darkness of that adversity into the marvelous light so people could look at her and see a woman who had triumphed over adversity despite the adversity. In every season of her life, she focused on that. When she was a mother, she focused on being a mother. When she was a wife, she focused on being a wife. When she was a teacher, she focused on being a teacher. When she was a widow struggling for her life, fighting for her life and for the life of her children, she focused on that. And even while she was taking care of other people, she focused on the task at hand at that time and at the appointed time after she had recognized her gifts and her strengths. She went back to school. She multiplied her knowledge. She multiplied her skill, her social circle, with the expertise that she needed to accomplish her task. With lecturers, with professors, with the people that she went to school with so she could increase the breadth of her reach and the resources that were available to her, she multiplied the knowledge that she had so that she could attain the knowledge that she needed to accomplish the task. And she started this TV talk show that people still talk about today. When I walk around town with my mother these days, people still look at her like she's a celebrity. This woman who struggled to take care of us fulfills her purpose every day. Not just with a TV talk show, which she did, but now she does counseling. Purpose is a process. And that process necessitates being planted in God. Purpose. Many of us are sick because we don't have purpose. We don't recognize our purpose. You don't have to wait until you're the TV talk show to live out your purpose. No. When she was a daughter, she was a daughter. When she was a teacher, she was a teacher. When she was a wife, she was a wife. When she was a mother, she worked at that. When she was a widow, she worked at that. At every stage of her life, she buckled down, kept her head down, and did what she had to do for that season. God is a God of times and seasons. Be fruitful, yes. Multiply. 
replenish the earth, subdue it and have dominion. Your jurisdiction is the area in your life that you have triumphed over. Those hardships that you thought were the devil trying to take you out and unfair, that is what was setting you up for your comeback, for your purpose. The Bible says in all things give thanks. Give thanks for those hardships because they are setting you up, friend. For the destiny that God has for you. When we look at Genesis chapter 1, we see the intentionality of God. First, He made light. Day 2, He made the heaven, the firmament. Day 3, He created the earth and the seas. Day 4, He created lights in the firmament. Day 5, let the waters bring forth fish. Day 6, let the earth bring forth creatures. And He spoke. He was speaking to the sea, bring forth fish. He spoke to the earth. I heard this on social media and I am so sad that I don't have the reference where I heard this. But if you take a fish out of the sea, because remember God spoke to the sea and the fish came forth. And if you take a plant out of the soil, guess what? They will die. In the same way, when God said, let us make man in our image, if you take man out of God he will die we have to stay grounded in God once we take ourselves out of God we are dead we have to stay planted in God in the Word of God you know when I was looking at this verse let us make man in our image I actually wondered what God's image was and I don't know about you but I was searching the scriptures like what does God look like if God made us to be in his image what does he look like I guess if we look at us we can see what he looks like but I finally found something in Revelation chapter 1 where they're describing God the son of man that's actually Jesus but in Revelation 1 13 John the apostle John the beloved the revelator <laughs> in verse 12 when I turned to see who was speaking to me I saw seven gold lampstands this is Revelation chapter 1 verse 12 now verse 13 and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the son of man he was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest this is the new living translation verse 14 his head and his hair were white like wool as white as snow wow and his eyes were like flames of fire his feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves wow Revelation 1.16, he held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Now, that reminded me of Genesis 1. Let there be light. How I thought that when God said let there be light that he had created the sun, the moon and the stars. No, let there be light was day one. But he actually made the light in the firmament, the sun, moon, and the stars on day four. Here we see his face, Revelation 1, 16. <laughs> Genesis 1, the first book of the Bible, Revelation 1. Ooh. We see the image of God. This is so good. His face was like the sun in all its brilliance. I can't help but think that when God said, let there be light, it was his face that was like the sun in all its brilliance that was illuminating the earth now that's just me this is i'm not saying that it was i'm just reading the word of god and just thinking his face was like the sun in all its brilliance this is the image that we were made in but the thing the part of his image that actually hit me was that verse where it says, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And that reminded me of the last episode. Matthew 4, 4, Matthew 4. 
when Jesus and the devil were fighting it out in the wilderness and how they were using words. No, you know, the, the devil is telling Jesus, bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, it is written, it is written, it is written every time it is written. Jesus, the word of God, is quoting the word of God. And I see here when the Bible says that in the mouth of God, Jesus was a sharp two edged sword. I'm reminded that life and death is in the power of the tongue. When Jesus was in the wilderness talking back and forth, the devil saying this and Jesus saying it is written. Those are fighting words. Why? Because every word that comes out of his mouth is the sword. The sword is the weapon and the weapon is in his mouth. So if we are made in his image, mm, our mouths also have a sword coming out of them. That's why it says that life and death is in the power of the tongue because we can wield that sword and bring life or we can wield that sword and bring death. Wow. You know, when I think about that analogy where someone said a fish out of sea dies and a plant out of soil dies, when we are without God, we do die because even Acts 17:28 says that in him, God, in him we live and move and have our being. We are his. We, mm, he is lives in us and the verse says as some of your own poets have said we are his offspring you know when god made the plants and he put in them the herb bearing seed and the fruit bearing seed and then he made the cattle and said be fruitful multiply and he told the fish too and the fowl of the air be fruitful multiply after he'd spoken to the sea and he made fish and told the fish to be fruitful multiply he spoke to the earth when god made us he did not just speak he formed us and we come from him we are his offspring according to acts 17 28 we are his offspring this makes me think of my nephew i have a beautiful nephew his name is sabiti and he looks like his mother my sister he looks like his mother now my sister his mother looks like my mother she's like her carbon copy they say now my mother looks a lot like her father my grandfather we call him Baba she looks a lot like Baba and it just makes me wonder how far back I can go with this. Sometimes I look at Sabiti and I see my, my sister. Sometimes I look at him and I see my distant cousin. Sometimes I look at him and I see my father. And it just makes me wonder how far back I go if I looked at Sabiti and I met Adam. Adam. I wonder what part of Adam Sabiti looks like. You know? But even more importantly, what part of Yahweh, what part of Elohim does Sabiti exude? Is it his eyes? Is it his tongue? Is it the way he walks? We are his offspring. We are made in the express image of God. When God said, let there be light, when God spoke, when he was creating, we've seen patterns in this. He spoke he created then he named earth the seas he named them and then he gave them purpose god is such a good god he doesn't just create he created everything so strategically he created the earth before he created man you know when we finish <laughs> the chapter in verse 29 let me just read from verse 28. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, which was from day five, over the fowl of the air from day five and over every living thing that moves upon the earth from day six earlier on in day six. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you 
it shall be for meat. Now, God had created every herb bearing seed before he created man. He was setting everything up strategically for the crown of creation to come and rule and have dominion. And he even told man, this is your mandate. This is why I made you be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it and have dominion. But also, he said, this, this is your food. He was so generous and so kind he told us what to eat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life i have given every green herb for meat and it was so talk about provision he creates he names he gives purpose and then he gives provision this is what you shall eat and god verse 31 god saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day ha le lu ya god was intentional when he created nothing was amiss he created light day one the firmament day two the seas and the earth on day three lights in the firmament sun moon and stars on day four day five let the waters bring forth creatures fish and then he also made birds the fowl of the air and then he named them and he told them be fruitful multiply everything after its own kind then on day six he said let the earth bring forth creatures for everything in creation he spoke but when it came to man he made he fashioned and then he gave purpose and then he said this is what you shall eat if that is not a good god a an intentional god a strategic god i don't know what is god provided for his offspring he gave them what to eat. He told Adam what to eat like a good parent. What a good, good father. We really are his offspring, the apple of his eye, just like a parent would, setting his child up for success. A word to the wise. When God said in verse 29, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat when he pointed out exactly what to eat he had a plan these days we see a lot of fruit a lot of herbs a lot of quote unquote food that has lost its ability to multiply to be fruitful that is not part of the definition of food according to Genesis 1.29. So anything that is technically genetically modified, because we know a lot of genetically modified food is actually modified to not reproduce. See, that's the difference between God and man. God is so good in his engineering, in his creation. He made, he created so that it would multiply on its own. But when man creates, let's say food, and creates genetically modified food for the good of man, that fruit does not multiply so that the farmers can go back to the source of the genetically modified seed every harvest but God is not like that he gives you and wants you to multiply that's the difference between God and man creator and the creation God's strategy was for us to have dominion if we are out of that strategy, we are like a fish out of water. We are like a ship without a rudder, without direction. God is telling us, this is why I made you. 
if we don't have that we see this a lot in modern medicine lots of people having trouble identity issues and so they have depression and self-hate because they haven't fulfilled they feel like they haven't fulfilled the purpose god made for them but it is god who made you go to him he will tell you why he made you but you don't need to necessarily hear his booming voice the sound of many waters just go to genesis 1 28 we talked about it be fruitful friend multiply replenish the earth subdue it and have dominion that is your purpose friend that purpose is linked to your health it is linked to your life may you live out your purpose every single day because it is then that we will exude the glory of the one who made us it is only then that we will have the fruit that we were made to exude when god brought me to this lesson he was showing me and you today how intentional he is the god who made the heavens and the earth and the firmament and the lights in the firmament and the waters and the fish and the fowl of the air and the fruit and the earth bearing seed and made it self-sustaining that God made you then God fashioned you in your mother's womb that God knows everything about you and loves you and gave you purpose trust him trust that he knows what he's doing in the same way when i look at my mother's life and how every step of her life although in isolation different seasons might have seemed pointless just pointless suffering but how god orchestrated in those times in her life her purpose that we may begin to trust that we may lean in on the one who made us because he is able to do all things the bible says in all things god works all things together for the good of those that love him god is working everything out for your good the obstacles the trials the pain the deaths the suffering the god who created the heavens and the earth very strategically created you very strategically and no matter what you're going through he is able to weave a beautiful story that we will be able to read and see god's hand trust his hand trust his face trust his wisdom trust god the god who created you is powerful and nothing is too hard for him ah sovereign god jeremiah said ah sovereign god jeremiah 32 verse 17 you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm nothing is too hard for you no sickness no illness no disease no hardship no divorce no marriage no relationship nothing is too hard for him so rest in that my friends elohim is strategic about you follow him be planted in him and you will bring forth fruit in due season at the appointed time god bless you friends thank you for tuning in to the fearfully and wonderfully made show with dr june see you next week until then friends the lord bless you and keep you The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.